It's time to start. It is six o'clock. Hopefully, there are people online watching us too, and and uh, we get to uh, we get to be here, right? Amen. Amen. We get to be in this place, and we get to open God's Word. We're going to be in Malachi chapter two, starting with verse ten, as we continue on this this look through this uh, warning uh, that God was giving to the nation of Israel. Uh, the oracles that he was um, giving through the prophet Malachi. Um, and let's go ahead and begin with prayer. Uh, there's a lot of things going on. Uh, you probably have seen in the news uh, gas shortages and some different things over in the East Coast. Uh, a lot of unrest in the Middle East. And uh, we need to be aware of those things and be praying for them, but also not fearful of them because God is still in control. Amen. But let's, uh, let's open up with a word of prayer, and then we will continue on in this look through uh, Malachi, and uh, we'll just have a good time with it. Father, I thank you for this time. I thank you, Lord, for the opportunity to be here. I thank you for each person that's here, not only in this room, but in our, uh, with our children and with our youth. And, Lord, I pray that your presence would be in uh, every place where we're uh, teaching and uh, trying to uh, tell others about you. And I pray, Father, that our hearts would be open to, to hear the truth of your word and to see how it's applicable to us today. And uh, if you're unchanging, if you're the same yesterday, today, and forever, then, Lord, uh, these principles still stand. Your, uh, your expectations have not wavered. Uh, your uh, desire for us has not uh, waned. And, Lord, your love for us has certainly not grown cold. And so, Father, I praise you and I thank you that, that you are watching over us. We lift up our country to you and uh, the unrest that is uh, throughout the country. We pray, Lord, that your people um, that, that know you and uh, that you know by name, Lord, that they would begin to stand up and they would begin to, to live out the life that you've called them to live rather than being on the sidelines and, and, uh, and simply... Uh, watching the events go by, I pray that, that you would raise your, your children up to, to be active and to be uh, the ambassadors and the witnesses that you've called us to be. And I pray, Father, that uh, through us we would bring hope to those that are in darkness, that we would illuminate those that can't see, that we would help those uh, that are uh, hopeless, and that, Lord, you would uh, use us for your glory and your honor, that it would not be about us, but it would be about you. We lift up uh, the events around the world as um, it just seems like chaos is reigning over in the Middle East. And I know, Lord, that that's been a constant, but uh, we, do, we do pray for uh, your intervening hand. We pray, Lord, that uh, you would uh, watch over uh, your people and just uh, pray that 
you would uh, bring peace. And we know, Lord, ultimate peace will come when Christ returns. And, and Lord, even for that, we pray. We pray that that would be soon and, and that, uh, Lord, it would be a wonderful event. But until that time, Lord, there are people that don't know you. And so I pray that you would give us a hunger and uh, a desire and uh, just a, a holy discontent uh, at sitting around and doing nothing but a hunger and a desire to go and tell others about you and to live out that life before them so that it can be a witness. Now, Lord, as we open your word and we see the warnings that you gave to your people, uh, Lord, I, I pray that we would uh, be able to see how that applies to us today. It's in your son Jesus' holy and precious name we pray. Amen. Amen. So pay no attention to the whiteboard to my right. Uh, if you're online looking for y'all, it would look like to my left, I guess. But um, pay no attention to this whiteboard here and, and the little squiggly letters. We'll get to that in a little bit. But I'll give you a preview. When we get down, this passage is primarily, or a lot of times when you read this passage and we get to verse 16, you're going to go, oh, I've heard that passage before. Because chapter 2, verse 16 is where it says, God hates divorce or I, I hate divorce. And we read that passage and we always think of it in the sense of a relationship between a man and a woman. And of course, God does not intend for us to separate or to part, uh, to, to divorce. But I want you to be open to the fact that maybe there's a little bit different context of how God is using the prophet Malachi to proclaim this truth about he hates divorce. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be about, um, about relationship and not just with, between a husband and a wife, but relationship with him. What this passage is about is essentially about being faithful followers of God. And I have these three Hebrew words, and we'll talk about them when we get to that, to that verse, verse 16. But the top word is the Hebrew word that's found in the passage here in Malachi. And then the bottom two are found, one's found in Leviticus and others found in Deuteronomy, Isaiah, and Jeremiah. All three, very evidently, by, by looking at them, because there are different letters up there, they're all three different words, but in the English we all define them as divorce. So it's one of those words that we only have one word for in the English language, or we don't um, translate that in a way that it, it conveys the meaning that the different Hebrew words uh, have up there. So um, with that, let's go ahead and I'm going to read through verses 10 through 16 of Malachi. And uh, we're going to uh, get into this uh, passage verse by verse. Don't all of us have one father? Didn't one God create us? Why then do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Judah has acted treacherously and detestably, and, and, and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem. For Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary, which he loves, and has married the daughter of a foreign god. To the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any descendants from the tents of Jacob, even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts. And this is another thing you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. Yet you ask, for what reason? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have acted treacherously against her, though she was your marriage partner and your wife by covenant. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of his life breath? And what does one seek? A godly offspring. So watch yourselves carefully, and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. Bottom line in, in this oracle, what God is expecting of his people and what he is warning them through the prophet uh, Malachi is that he wants them to keep faith with the covenant that they had made with him. The covenant that uh, had been inaugurated, uh, and it had been inaugurated through blood. Uh, it's, not this, it's not the new covenant inaugurated through the blood of Christ, but 
Um, there was blood sprinkled on the altar in order to inaugurate the Old Testament covenant and uh, the promises that God had, had made to his people Israel. And they were not keeping faith with him. Now he says, well, what's one of the promises he, he tells us um, about our relationship with, with him? Will he ever leave us? Okay, so what's, that, what's, that, what's Jesus say? I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so God is still the same. He's a, he was the same in the Old Testament, and he's the same today. He still loves us with a jealous love, with an unending love, with an unconditional love. He still loves us greatly. And he says, I'll never leave you, I will never forsake you. And he also promised that to his people. He told Israel, you will always be my people. Until I return, you will always be my people. And, and so he is reminding them of this in this oracle. And so day in and day out, God is the same, right? And if that means he is the same, does that mean he's boring? No. <laughs> it just means he's going to react or he's going to act in the same manner each and every time. So if God hates sin in the Old Testament, do you think God hates sin any less today? So if God wanted his people, his covenant people, to be faithful, does he want us to be faithful? Okay. Now we look back at the, at the children of Israel and we see their history. And how many of you ever, have ever um, been in a sermon or heard a teaching or listened to a preacher and he starts talking about the, the nation of Israel being disobedient and you go, how could they do that? Have you ever wondered about that? I mean, really, when you're going through Deuteronomy and, or you're going through Exodus and, and they've seen him part the Red Sea and then they get to the other side and all of a sudden they start grumbling. We don't have any water. So he brings water from a rock. You know, and they see this and then they go a little further. Well, we're hungry. And he brings manna and quail and, and all the things that he provides for them. And he tells them that, that he's going to uh, give them the promised land. And time and time again, they continue to be disobedient or unfaithful and you know we look at that and we just kind of shake our head right Paul I mean how could they do that I mean God I mean, God did miraculous things to bring them out and he continued to do miraculous things throughout their history and and they would hold to the the first five books of the Bible the Pentateuch and then they had the prophets and they had the Psalms and they had all of these writings and they would learn them and they would make them a part of the, their heart. In fact, their kids were better educated than our kids. And their, their adults were better educated on the Old Testament than we are today. They would, they would be able to uh, recite that and to talk about it and to bring up the prophecies and to talk about those things and the promises of God and the commands of God. And yet they continued to break them. And we continue to look at them and shake our head. And yet we do the very same things when we break a commandment of God today. But we're not going to go to the mirror and look in the mirror and go, oh, how could you do that? Or maybe you do. I don't know. I, I do. I, sometimes I, I get to that point now. I, I, I know I do something that I shouldn't do or don't do something I should do. And I think, why in the world would I even make that choice? Do you ever think that about yourself? Now, let me ask you this. Do you ever look at some of your fellow Christians and say, how can they do that? How can they do that? Don't they know what God did for them? So this passage is about keeping faith. It's about God warning his people that they needed to stay with their first love, with him. He was the one that provided for them. He is the one that protected them. He was the one that watched over them. And so this is the third oracle that Malachi is bringing. And the first one was he dealt with the doubt that the people had that God even loved them. How have you loved us? And then God makes that definitive statement, I have loved you. I have chosen you and I will never leave you. And then he goes and, and gives a warning about the priest. And so we did two, two Wednesday nights on that and how the priests were, were not bringing the proper attitude to, in worship. They were, they were allowing people to get away with things, which I guess in a way uh, points back to me, but I also pointed it right back at you because y'all are part of a royal priesthood, which means, yes, Virginia, is she in here? 
Virginia is not here. Never mind. Yes, Virginia, we are our brother's keeper. We are to help one another and hold one another accountable. We are to, to encourage one another to do right and to do good. And so, uh, like I said in the very beginning, traditionally this passage has been uh, preached about divorce. And many a preacher, and, and myself included, as I called up and looked at some of my old notes, um, I started seeing that, well, maybe I wasn't reading this in context correctly. Because if it's a warning to God's people, why in the middle of this warning would he go to the relationship between a husband and a wife? Now, he uses that as a principle, but, but it is still about the covenant relationship of Israel to God. And so he's sitting there and he's looking at this, and, and um, God certainly does hate divorce, but what he hates even worse is our unfaithfulness. All right, so let's, let's look at this. Um, now, we have an individual relationship with God. We have a different covenant that we're under because of Christ. We have a personal relationship with the living God. But in this oracle, there, it is a corporate warning to the nation of Israel. They had a corporate or a national relationship with God as well. And we don't have that. We don't need that today. We, we are part of God's church. We're his body. But he has not instituted a nation that he's called his people like he did in the Old Testament. Although Paul makes it very clear that not all Israel is Israel, but those that are circumcised in the heart rather than in the flesh. And then he also says that we've been grafted into the, the, the uh, cultured root. We're a wild olive branch that's been grafted in to the, to the cultured olive tree. And so we are part of God's family. But, we're, but I just want to make the distinction. The oracle here is about a national warning to a people who have broken faith. And that's why I also go to this idea of divorce. Is not, he's not going to go from this national warning and this corporate warning down to an individual couple, even though he does hate divorce, it's not, it's not just about that. Okay? It's okay, so that's laying the foundation. So let's look at two rhetorical questions that start out here in verse 10. And they're really the antithesis of what is going on. Um, the, the real thesis of what's going on is found in the second part of verse 10 where he says... Why do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? That's the, that's the thesis. God is, is making that uh, accusation through the prophet Malachi. Why do, you pro, why do you act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our fathers? Why do you do this and, and uh, go against the covenant that I set for you? And he has two antitheses or two antithetical questions that he starts out with. And this all kind of goes with treachery, but the first part of uh, verse 10 says, don't all of us have one father? Obviously, we do, right? One God, one father. And this theme of father runs through Malachi, and it's implied in the opening where God says, I have loved you. And the implication there is he's, uh, he's loved us like a father. Uh, he is watching over us. He has that unconditional love for us. Um, he is, it's implied in the opening de declaration of God's love for Jacob in uh, chapter 1, verse 2. It's then used in 1, verse 6 to uh, rebuke the priestly carelessness. If I'm a father, he, he asked, where is the honor due me? And it's alluded to in chapter 3, verse 17, which we'll get to next uh, in a couple weeks, in the promise of God's future compassion on Israel. He says, I will spare them just as a as in compassion a man spares his son who serves him. So there's this there's this um, theme of the father running through this oracle that he is a father talking to his children. And and the nation of Israel would have seen that if they read this, although I doubt that they received it well in the time of Malachi. They probably saw it and said, I don't know if I really want to to, to listen to that, but that first rhetorical question or that first antithetical question is, don't all of us have one father? And then the second one was, 
Did not one God create us? That's the second question. That's the second antithetical question there. And it refers not to the whole of creation. What, what the prophet is referring to here is the uniqueness of God's covenantal people. The Hebrew language in that is very clear. He uses a different word for, for um, the nations or, or for create in the, in the idea of creating everything that we see around us in Genesis. So it's a different word here that's still cr uh, translated create. But he says, didn't one God create us all? Talking specifically to the nation of Israel. But he's also talking to us because we're also his children. Didn't one God create each one of us? And so we see this allusion also in Paul's one body uh, allusion in Ephesians 4.25. Does anybody have their Bible and look up 4.25? Ephesians 4.25. I should have warned y'all. I got it. Four twenty-five. Somebody read it out loud. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. We are members of one another. And in the context of that, he says, be angry and do not sin. So it's very much the New Testament context of this Malachi passage where he's talking about, yes, he did create all things, but he created his covenantal people and he created, he created us as his covenantal people under the new covenant. And so these two questions come with that charge that uh, we talked about here uh, in verse 10. Why do we act treacherously then against one another? Why do we act this way against one another, profaning the covenant of our father, our fathers? Referring back to the covenant that God made with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. He says, why do you treat each other this way? And today we could ask the same question. Christians, why do we treat each other the way we treat each other? God is giving them a warning, and he's going to call them out on this. And he is the same yesterday, today, and forever. God hates it when his covenant people try to destroy one another or eviscerate one another with words or put one another down or cheat one another or hate one another or fail to forgive one another. It's all the same. Man, it is quiet in here. You could hear a pin drop. <laughs> and, and I study these things, and a, and a knife goes through my own heart because I know that, that I do these things, and yet I can go to a God that will listen to me, and I can ask Him to forgive me, and I can ask Him to change me, and I can be more like Him because eventually what He really wants us is to be more like Him. And so why do we act treacherously against one another, profaning the covenant of our Father? Why are we unfaithful, breaking faith with one another? I don't know the complete history of this church, but somebody once told me that there was a church split. It should never happen. It should never happen with Christians. If we're called to forgive one another, there's nothing, there's nothing that should cause us to break fellowship with one another. I've heard of too many people say they got hurt at church and they're not coming back. And really in their life, that's unforgiveness. They're not willing to forgive whoever may have hurt them. And it hurts my heart to think that. And it hurts my heart that, that they may have been hurt at church. Chances are whoever did whatever they did to hurt that person doesn't even know they did what they did to hurt that person. Now sometimes they do. There are people that are, that are uh, vindictive. There are people that are not nice. And by the way, that's where we come into account in holding one another accountable. When we see somebody 
speaking in untruth or speaking in an unkind manner or speaking in a way that, that would hurt that person, you have every right to intervene. You have every right to say, wait, listen, that's not the way we talk to each other. That's not the way we interact. But we don't want to do that, do we? We don't want to hold them accountable. But how we live is a spiritual act of worship, right? And he's already gotten on to the priest by not holding people accountable, by bringing less than a perfect sacrifice to the altar. And so that second warning comes into play here as his people. Then we need to be about holding one another accountable in love, not ugly, but in love, holding people accountable and, and helping them to get along rather than to break fellowship. And it's hard, isn't it? Because sometimes we get, in, we get it in our mind that we're right and we don't want to change. Or we get it in our mind that we've been wronged and we, don't, we want somebody to, to, to have their pound of flesh. We want, we want to see that. And we don't want to let it go and forgive. And oh, by the way, let me, let me just really meddle now. It's not up to the other person to come and ask you for forgiveness. It's up to you to forgive whether they come and ask for forgiveness at all. It's not for them to, to come and say, you know, I was wrong. It's really up to you to say, Lord, I want to I forgive them and I want to let that go. Now, if you've wronged somebody, I would tell you the Bible tells you to go to that person. Try to make amends. Offer apologies. Try to make it right. That's on you as well. But if somebody does hurt you or harm you, it's just, it's just better to say, okay, Lord, let me love them anyway. It doesn't mean you're a doormat. It doesn't mean that you allow somebody to walk over you. But if the body is working right, someone will, will hold that person accountable and help correct wrong action. Because when we try to hurt or harm a fellow Christian, we are breaking faith with the covenant that we live under. That's what God was saying right here. No, no, uh, no quibbling about it. No, uh, nothing we can really talk about that. He says in verse 11, Judah has acted treacherously and a detestable thing has been done in Israel and in Jerusalem for Judah has profaned the Lord's sanctuary which he loves and has married the daughter of a foreign god. What he's talking about is Israel, you have run after another god. I won't, I won't say what day it is, but it's a special day for you. Right? But that's the same as Billy looking at you going, I like her better, pointing to somebody else and running after her. <laughs> you think I'm an idiot? <laughs> I merely use you as an illustration, and, and I knew that it would not really happen. But, but the mere thought of that or the mere discussion of it, you know... Um, you two. Y'all aren't going to go. I could say your names, but anyway. <laughs> the Talbots here, or the, the Peters, or the Renfros, or anybody else that's married in this room. If you said that, they, that one or the other spouse was going to run after another woman or another man, you would go, oh, no, no, that's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. And if it did, it would be reprehensible. But he's not just talking about marriage here. He was talking about the nation of Israel running after foreign gods, running after the world and not following him. And when we run after the things of the world rather than run after God, when we try to do things in our own power or make our own way or create our own wealth or or uh, try to carve out our own life, or we look at God and say, I don't need you, or we, or we do any of those things, we are committing adultery against him. We're running after the world. We're running after a foreign God. And we don't like to hear it that way, do we? It's not quite as palatable. Jim, just stick to the nation of Israel. God is getting on them. Don't get on us. Don't get on, I'm getting on myself too. As a corporate whole, they had failed to follow God's commands 
They no longer held up the temple worship. We've already seen that. They were acting treacherously against one another. By this time, the the nations had already split. The ten tribes had gone into Israel. The two tribes of Judah and Benjamin had stayed uh, down, and they were uh, the nation of Judah. So even the twelve tribes that God had brought out and made one people had already split. So they've acted treacherously against one another. Um, tribe would fight against tribe. It was it was a lot of things were going on, and God said, "This is not what I made you for." I made you to be my bride, and you're running after foreign gods. And so you see the hypocrisy of that. And in verse 12, he begins to say, listen, I'm going to cut you off. To the man who does this, may the Lord cut off any descendants. That's pretty harsh. To the man that chases after another god, I hope you don't have any children. I hope you don't reproduce. I hope your line dies. Why is it important that he talks about that? Remember, he gave the inheritance to families. And there was a provision in the law that if a son died without having raised an heir that his wife, that the next son in line would, would uh, take his wife as his own and raise up an heir for that line so that line would never be lost in Israel. Now that sounds really foreign to us. But the point was, God so loved his people that, and that the line that they carried, the name that they carried, was so important that he wanted to make sure that that line continued on and on and on because his promises were that if you keep my commands, I will bless you and I will continue to grow you and, and provide for you. And so that is the, the context with which we see this, where God, through the prophet Malachi, says, if that person runs after another God, let his line be cut off. Let him no longer have an inheritance in the nation of Israel. Do you see the gravity of that? This is God talking about his people that he's done so much for. And he says, listen, when you, when you do this, finally, I just no more. Hopefully your line will just be cut off. That'll be it. You're done. The second part of verse 12, he goes, May the Lord cut off any descendants from the tents of Jacob even if they present an offering to the Lord of hosts, even if they come back, he says, let them be cut off. Now we know that as God's children, he'll never leave us nor forsake us. We also know that his promises to his people, Israel, will always, he will always be faithful to that until the end. He says that. And he always brought back a remnant. And we can get into the whole thing about if you're an ethnic Jew, if you were in that line, that unless you give your life to Jesus, you're not going to be with him in heaven. And that's still the truth. That's still the, the way it is. But God has never forgotten his covenant with his nation of Israel. Jesus said not one jot or tittle of the law would, would pass away until I come again in my glory. And so God is still watching out for his people. Even though he'd send them off into exile, he'd bring them back. But what he's making the point here is, don't chase any other gods. Don't be unfaithful to me. Now, we know that we don't lose our salvation. But the, but the, but the idea is still the same. God would tell us, don't be unfaithful to your covenant. Don't be unfaithful to the promise that you made or to the fact that you gave your life to Jesus, that your life is no longer your own. You have no right to go out and do exactly what you want and to to sin and to follow after foreign gods or to chase after the world or to do anything else. Really, what you should be doing is doing what I command you to do. Now, Jesus said, if you love me, you'll keep my commands. And so if you love somebody, it's not really hard keeping a command, right? If you love them, you keep it. I mean, it's kind of like here. 
Everybody goes, do you like your work? It didn't work. It's hard, but it's not work. Isn't that right, Brandon? Amen. I mean, if you love what you do, then it's not. It's not Mike, you, you were smiling from ear to ear on the phone. I didn't even get to see you, but Monday, you were pretty happy. And if you love your work, it's not hard to go every day. And so he's telling them, listen, even if you come back, I'm not going to take your offerings and I'm going to reject them. This is another thing, verse 13, uh, you do. You cover the Lord's altar with tears, with weeping and groaning, because he no longer respects your offerings or receives them gladly from your hands. You've run off, you've chased a foreign god, and then you come back and you ask him for his blessings. You bring offerings to the altar and prayers before him, but you're still chasing that foreign god. I think, I'm sure you all have heard me tell the story about the young man in ROTC. Came in, wanted me to pray for him. I'll tell it again if you haven't heard it. He wanted, he wanted me to pray for him. Major Tucker, I want, you to bring, I want you to pray that my girlfriend comes back. Are you, living, are you sleeping with her? Yes. You're living with her? Yes. So you want me to pray that God would bring her back so you can continue to live in the sin that you were in. Well, you know, that's hard when somebody puts it that way. And that's, ex- that's the same thing that was going on here. They're chasing the foreign God, but they want God's blessing, and they want to bring offerings to the altar, and they want him to listen to them, and yet they are still playing the harlot. And this young man, you know, I said, I'll pray for you, but you, but you have to promise me you can't, if she comes back, you can't move in together and live together. And I've told the story. He, she came back about three months later. He was all excited. He said, well, she's a little mad at me right now. I told her she couldn't move back in. She had to go live with her girlfriends. And I told her we couldn't sleep together anymore. And anyway, six months later, she was a Christian. And a year and a half later, they were married. So God redeems that. But you can't go to God and ask him to bless you when you're walking in sin. And as much as you cry out to him, and as much as you, you wail and, and tear your clothes and throw ashes on your head and do all the things that they used to do back then, if any of y'all do that, take a picture of it, I'd like to see. <laughs> but as much as we go to God and we go, oh God, please, please, please. And then you go off and you do the things that you know are against his commands. Why do you have any expectation of him listening to you? He's not going to bring you back just so that you can continue to walk in sin. A good father wouldn't do that. You wouldn't bring your child back, restore them, so that they can go and continue to do the dangerous things that they're doing. You would try to get them to not do those dangerous things anymore. You'd want them to get out of that bad habit or that bad uh, circumstance. And so he's, he's looking at their hypocrisy and, and at their arrogance. And in verse 14, he goes, Yet you ask, for what reason? How come you won't listen to us, God? I'm your child. How come you won't hear my prayer and, and, and answer it? God's already told him. You're running around with a foreign God. You're not following me. You're not keeping my commands. But they're sitting there putting the blame back on God. How come you won't listen to me? Have you ever heard a Christian go, God's just not listening to me. I pray and pray and pray and he's not listening to me. And you know good and well what they're doing. He's not listening to me. He, I, no reason to pray. He's not going to listen. It's the same thing when you go, for what reason? How come you won't listen to us, God? Because the Lord has been a witness between you and the wife of your youth. The Lord has seen. He was the witness there between you and the covenant that your fathers made. You have acted treacherously against her. Though she was your marriage partner and your wife by consent. I mean, he's really, really getting after them. And he says, listen, you've acted corruptly, unfaithfully against the covenant that your father made with me. And what do you expect? 
And then he gets down to verse 15, and we're almost done. Didn't the one God make us with a remnant of his life breath? He gets back to that. Aren't we all created by one God? Don't we all have one Father? Didn't that one God breathe the breath of life into you? Isn't he the one that brought you about? You didn't bring about your own life. You're the clay. He's the potter. The clay pot doesn't tell the potter how to do his business. The potter does his business the way he wants to. And so, didn't God make us with a remnant of his life breath? And what does the one seek? What does the father seek? Godly offspring. He sat there and said, I just want you to follow my commands. I just want you to, to, to live the way I've asked you to live. And it's no different today. I just want you to live the way I've asked you to live. And that means, by the way, I'll stop right here just for a second and throw this in. That means it's not my responsibility to teach you everything that you know so that you can live right. It's my responsibility to put the truth before you and to help you start someplace and then take something that, that God speaks to your heart with and begin to study it even more and to, to hide His Word in your heart so that you won't sin against Him. And it's up to you to examine your own life and ask God, where is it I need to change? What needs to be taken away or what needs to be taken out of me so that you can have more of me and there's less of me trying to, to walk my own path and I keep my eyes on you walking the path with you. God wants godly offspring. Makes sense? So watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously against the wife of your youth. There's that illusion again. Don't act treacherously against the covenant that you've made with me, God says. If he hates and divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel. He covers his garment with injustice, says the Lord of hosts. Therefore, watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. If he, meaning the nation of Israel, divorces his wife, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice. Now, this is where we get to these words, okay? The word in this passage is shalah. It means to send out. So what God is saying in, in a very uh, literal translation is if he hates and sends his wife out, if he, if he doesn't care about the covenant that much, then he's already covered his garment with injustice. So the Hebrew word there is shalah. It means to send out. In Leviticus 21.7 where he talks about divorce, it's gerusha which means to drive out. So if a husband were to drive his wife out in that, and that is talking about a one-on-one -on -one relationship, uh, the marriage relationship, he says that he should give her a, a written uh, letter of divorce so that she won't be held accountable. And really God in that passage is holding the man accountable in, in Leviticus if he runs her off. And then the last one in Deuteronomy, I'm not even going to try to say it, but it's Kirithuth. Kirithuth? I can't say it. But anyway... In Deuteronomy 24.1, it's translated divorce, but it really means cutting off. So these two are very specifically about a relationship between a husband and a wife. But this one, in context, is about the nation and their relationship with God. And so when we use that out of context, that God hates divorce, while he does hate divorce... We've got to be careful not to use that out of context, make it something that it isn't. But he goes, if he, if my nation hates and divorces his wife, which is the covenant that, that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob made, then the Lord God of Israel, uh, says the Lord God of Israel, he covers his garment with injustice. Do you remember in Ruth uh, what Boaz did for Ruth when she laid down at his feet? He covered her with his garment. It was a sign of protection. It was a sign that he wanted to, to watch over her. He, it was a sign that he wanted to make things right with her and to marry her. 
And so it was a sign of he wanted to, to keep her pure. And so God says, when you, when you profane the covenant, you are making your garment filthy with injustice. And he says, listen, therefore watch yourselves carefully and do not act treacherously. So throughout this oracle, as he is warning the nation, what he's warning them about is be faithful to me. Return to me, be faithful. And what it says to us, his people, is if God doesn't change, and he's the same yesterday, today, and forever, he is just as adamant about us remaining faithful to him. And there's no excuse for us not. And there's really no reason for us to chase after the world. If you love the Lord with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength, and you meditate on his word, and you spend time with him, and you actually see that things are not coincidence, things aren't happening by chance, things are happening because God has planned them. God has ordered your steps because he loves you. And he wants you to keep your eyes on him. And so don't act treacherously. Don't think you can get away with it. Don't think because nobody's looking. Whew, I, got, I, I got past that because God always sees. And he's very jealous about the relationship that he has with you. And I shouldn't use that word because that has a negative connotation. But he is adamant about his relationship with you. Amen? So we have 15 minutes. Do you have any questions about this passage? Yes, sir. In the New Testament, um, it was a Greek word, and it had to do with the husband and wife relationship. Uh, and it related back to uh, Gerusha, to the to the Levitical 21.7 um, reading, because when they did the uh, Septuagint, when they translated the Hebrew into Greek 70 years before Jesus uh, walked the earth, which, by the way, the Septuagint, which was a Greek translation, was what Jesus would quote, and it's what Paul would quote. They used, um, in the Greek translation, the same Greek word that they used in the New Testament, Jesus used for divorce, in the, in the Greek New Testament for Leviticus 21.7. So there's a direct correlation there, and that verse is talking about when a man divorces his wife, not the covenantal relationship between the nation and God. So, yes, there's a direct correlation, but it's to the 21.7 Hebrew word. Yeah. Like, oh, this is, okay, I'm going to use these phrases so that you understand what I'm saying. Feels like an Old Testament parable. Yeah, but in context, it starts out talking about the nation and the covenant. No, I get it. Yeah. But, but all the other language is something that you could relate to and understand. Oh, that's oh. wrong. I get that. Oh, yeah, yeah, it would. I mean, using the husband and wife relationship is a metaphor, and, and you see that. If you're unfaithful, you know, then don't, don't expect to go back crying to them and, and them taking you back, you know, happy and all that. So, yeah, you're right. It, it is sort of like an Old Testament parable, but because of the language, because it's an oracle or a warning, it carries a greater weight than a parable. Parables were always trying to illustrate a point. God is, is trying to warn his people, quit being unfaithful to me. So there's a much more direct point to it. But it is very similar. That's pretty good. That's a pretty good connection, by the way. But God outright said, you are my bride. You are, you know, he relates that relationship, the covenant, with the marriage. And he says, you know, you're, you, you are being unfaithful. He says that in the Bible. And, and so he used jealousy. He says, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. I remember when Oprah went through that, you know, I just can't, you know, leave that. I just can't, you know, that's just immature. I'm like, uh, God can be what he wants. Yeah. God can, so, yeah. you know, when you and I are jealous, we might be immature. But God is God. And we don't get to dictate what he is jealous over. He, he sacrificed all. Amen. And we had nothing. Yeah. And you see that, oh, that same language in the Old Testament. You're right. I mean, it, it, we, we and, and again, it's also a translation which doesn't go one for one. But, but yeah, we see things imperfectly. But God can, when he says he's jealous over us, it's not a negative thing. It is, it is a right thing. Uh, I, this is, I, I didn't see this in any commentaries. But, you know, in the New Testament, a lot of the allusions to the body of Christ, we're the bride of Christ, uh, he's the bridegroom, uh, we're going to be married to him. Uh, all of these allusions, since the Old Testament is, pr- is a progressive revelation, um, I might write my dissertation on that. Anyway, um, <laughs> there is a connection between the, the uh, marriage discussion or that, that illustration in the Old Testament and a direct correlation to, to that in the New Testament as well because it's still talking about God's people but just in a more... Um, uh, revealed or evolved state, and so anyway, I wasn't going to bring that up, but I thought about that today as I was finishing up my study, and and you kind of helped me bring that out. So, any other questions? Well, a, a comment, and that is, <clears throat> offerings in at this time were basically for two effects. One was to say thank you, God, and those are the far minority, and the other one was for forgiveness of sins is an offering to put my sin on that animal and for that animal to take that sin and for God to give me his righteousness. And because any offering that's doing that, saying I'm going to go out and sin after this, is like any Christian today who says, you know, Christ came for my sin, but I'm going to go do this, that, and so on. It's a mockery. Yes. Psalm 51 says, You do not want sacrifice or I would give it. You're not pleased with the burnt offering. The sacrifice pleasing to God is a broken spirit. You will not despise a broken and humbled heart. So you can lay as many offerings on the altar as you want, but if your heart is not right, it means nothing. And if, and if they're still playing the harlot running after false gods and they come back to the altar and go through the motions, God says, I ain't listening. I ain't listening because you're not sincere. And that's exactly what you were saying there. Um, we've got to be sincere when we come back to him. What were you going to say, Brandon? Amen. Oh, okay. I thought, I thought a couple times you started it. You wanted to say something. You just on the edge. I hear good preaching. I'm going to tag team, but I'm, <laughs> okay. I'm absorbing some stuff. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, well, thank you all for coming. Um, Malachi is a heavy book, but, uh, you know, one, we have a different relationship in that God has already forgiven us all of our sin. But that doesn't, in a, in a way, that's really good, but in, in another way, it's bad because we, we tell ourselves God's already forgiven us for all our sin. And the flesh uses that as leverage to say, go on. Should we continue to sin that grace may increase, Paul says in Romans. And then he goes on and says, may it never be. But the flesh lies to us. And so we continue to chase foreign gods. We continue to to play the harlot uh, with the world because we go, I'm already saved. But what you should learn out of Malachi, especially in this part right here, is God's not mocked. I mean, he does not want half-hearted worship. He wants all of you. And that means every part of you. And uh, we can't just always go about and say, oh, well, there I went and sinned again. Well, good thing God forgave me for it on the cross. I mean, we just can't do that. And, and unfortunately, I don't know about you, but early on in my life, I found myself doing that a lot. And probably every Christian has found themselves doing that. 
Oh, I'm so glad, God, that you had forgiven me for that. I shouldn't have done that. And then you go and do it the same thing again. Or you go and do the same thing again until you all of a sudden you go, God, I really am broken over that. Please take it away. And then, then, then it gets removed. But we have to really come to him with a sincere heart. So, any other? Father, I thank you for this night. I thank you, Lord, for uh, your word. I thank you, Lord, for the encouragement because it is important to see that you are the same yesterday, today, and forever. That we can trust your responses. That we can understand that when you say you will never leave us, then you won't. Then when you say that you love us, you always will. When you say that you're jealous over us and about us, that's a good thing. And Lord, it, it, it is the same response. You hate sin. And Lord, I pray that we begin to hate the sin in our own lives as much as you hate that sin. And that we would yield ourselves to you and allow you to remake us and to shape us and to mold us into what you would want us to be. Vessels for your use. Useful for your purposes. Whatever that shape may be, whatever use you have for us, wherever you want us to go, Lord, I pray that we would go and to do and we would live faithfully with you that even when we stumble and fall, that, that our heart would be so broken over the, the sin that, that caused us to stumble, Lord, that that, uh, that would be forever removed from our life and that each uh, hour of every day um, more of that heart of stone would be taken out of our our chest and, and it would be replaced with a heart of flesh, one that follows you and loves you and, and uh, lets you guide us. Lord, I pray that it, uh, we would be a church that loves you and serves you and sets an example to others about you and that through our lives become a witness for you. Well, Father, I pray that you would uh, continue to shape and mold and change this body of believers. I pray, Father, for revival in this church amongst those that have drifted away and, and even within those of us that are holding on, Lord, that you would just um, create within us uh, a greater desire each and every day to follow you and to revive in us uh, a fresh uh, desire to serve and to love you. And Father, I pray that uh, we would reach this community uh, with the message of hope that you have and that Lord as the days grow dark that this um, this body of believers would shine even brighter as we yield ourselves to you Lord we love you and we praise you it's in Christ's name we pray amen